Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 41. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized pieces of consumable information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So it's Rick and myself today. Sebastian is gone. You'll probably be joining us within the next couple of weeks. We have a few guests that are coming in within the next couple of weeks that everyone should be very excited about. We have a very special, we have two very special guests today that Rick will be introducing very shortly. If you're watching the Cardano Effect podcast and you're not subscribed, please consider hitting the subscribe button. We're trying to grow this podcast as organically and as quickly as possible. We appreciate all the support. We appreciate all the comments. You can reach out to us on Telegram, Reddit, uh, Twitter. We are open and ready to communicate with everyone, trying to get as many guests as possible and expand the Cardano effect. So the past two episodes, just a quick recap, we had Professor Simon Thompson. Uh, we spoke about Marlowe, and we also had our weekly roundup with Rick and myself. So let us know how you, how you think those are going, and we will continue trying to bring guests and doing our live streams as well. So with that being said, I want to remind everyone that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. Remember, you are your best financial advisor. If you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. So without further ado, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? What's happening? Hey, I'm doing great, Philippe. Thanks for asking. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, IOHK, for sponsoring this podcast. And I would also like to remind the viewers, the podcast is available on Google Play Music, iTunes, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, and also available on pretty much any casting app you have out there. If there's any casting app that you do not see the the Cardano Effect available on, please let me know at thecardanoeffect.io. Today we have two special guests returning to the podcast. Is We have Lars Brunez and Polina Vinogravata, who have been on our podcast before with the episode from Africa. And so to give you a quick background on them, Lars Brunez is a PhD, is the Director of Education at IOHK. He holds a PhD in pure mathematics from the University of Regensburg, Germany, and after a postdoctoral year at the University of Cambridge in the UK and several years of research and teaching in Regensburg, he spent a decade working as a lead software architect on mathematical optimization software and web applications for an international IT community. He joined IOHK in 2016. Also, we have another PhD, Helena Vinogrovada. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm saying your name wrong. I gotta make sure I get it right, Vinogrodova. Thank you. I got to correct myself. Uh, formal method software developer at IOHK, and she holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Ottawa. Her PhD research consisted of a formalization of category theoretic proofs, definitions, and examples related to the study of abstract computation. She obtained her master's degree in mathematics, also from the University of Ottawa, with the focus of her thesis being on the study of abstract computation using category theory, and in particular, Turing categories. Well, thank you both for returning to the podcast today. And let's start off with Polina. Polina, how are you doing today? Where are you calling in from? Good. Uh, I'm calling in from Ottawa. It's uh, not very sunny today. You know, just morning, Saturday morning. It's pretty, pretty nice weather, but yeah. So doing All good. Right. <laughs> good. Well, welcome and thank you for being here. And Lars, where are you at right now? Hi, Rick. Hi, Philip. Thank you very much. And thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm actually uh, right now in Mallorca, which is a Spanish island in the Mediterranean. And I'm visiting my parents here for a couple of days and intend to work from here for a week. So it's very hot and uh, but nice. And a little later in the day. And thank you for being on also, Lars. So we have you guys on today to talk about your book recently released. It's Plutus Writing Reliable Smart Contracts, available uh, as a PDF file, it's available on GitHub, it's available on Amazon, so you can put it on several different e-reader platforms, and there's other ways of retrieving the book. Uh, we can, you can download from GitHub and compile it or something like that, or I don't know how those methods work for software engineers. I just went on Amazon and got it. Well, there's okay. also a version on LeanPub, which is um, also digit for digital books, and there it's incidentally also freely available on LeanPub. Okay, excellent. Well, congratulations on the re release of your book. So if you guys could tell me, just to kind of get us started off, what was the what was the most challenging part of writing the book? Was it getting the different sections that each of your writing put together, collaborating, 
getting feedback from other people. Uh, what, what did you think was the most challenging part? Um, I mean, those things that you mentioned are, of course, challenging, exactly as you said. I mean, because Polina and I split the chapters, we, we of course, they had to fit together, so we had to coordinate that. And um, But actually, to be honest, for me, the most challenging part was to actually learn Plutus first, because um, if you maybe remember from the Africa episode, so uh, during the course in Ethiopia, Polina was actually there for two weeks uh, when this Plutus course was taught to the Ethiopian students, but I wasn't there during those two weeks, so this was now the first time I actually dealt with Plutus in, in earnest, so um, I first had to learn it myself. But I always believe that um, the best way to, to learn something is actually to teach it, and the second best way is probably to write a book about it, so um, mm -hmm. I'm very glad that I had the opportunity to, to really um, work with Plutus very in, in lots of detail and uh, for a long time now. So now I really feel uh, confident about it. That's what I've heard from other software engineers. So once you learn one language, learning another language isn't that difficult, but it still takes some effort. Felina, you were going to say? Yeah, I mean, definitely learning Plutus was challenging. I'm really happy that I got to, uh, um, you know, experience it uh, taught to me, you know, by a person that knows what they're doing, Phil Wadler. Um, like back back and when we were teaching when when we were teaching the class um, and uh, yeah uh, but I was writing some of the beginning chapters and um, I it was kind of a challenge to figure out exactly uh, how much background to give people and you know how much detail and what to and you know like what to expect people will understand easily and what to you know really give extra details of explanation to because um, of course. Um, a lot of the, because Plutus isn't like a lot of, like the way it works isn't a lot of, <laughs> similar to many other things. So, you know, and uh, it took me a little bit of time to understand it. So, you know, just, I feel like presenting it in a way that's, um, is the right level of detail and uh, comprehensible to somebody who hasn't seen it before. I, I feel like that was definitely a struggle. Well, you did a good job because I'm not a software engineer and I'm able to read the paragraphs and I understand the paragraphs. I've gotten through the first two sections of the book and I understand the paragraphs. I do not understand the code. And I've talked to some Solidity developers who have also, they, they write Solidity presently and said, it's, a, it's some work to learn Plutus. So there's a, there's a learning curve there. However, the paragraphs are very well written. I do understand that part. Philippe, you had a little skim over the book too, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So um, I wanted to ask you a separate question. So let's go back to Plutus Fest last year. And uh, Charles said on stage that he wanted to basically get 10,000 Plutus developers. And, um, you know, writing this book is a step in the right direction. But what has been the feedback from the developer community for both of you? regarding your book and regarding how many people you're onboarding to learn Haskell and ultimately code in Plutus? I, of course, we are very eager to get feedback, but I think um, so far there haven't been many comments or so on, on Amazon, also on LeanPub where people actually um, said something. So, I mean, we were very gratified when we saw that people are actually getting the book. So I think, I don't know, I think it's yeah. something like 250 people now, maybe. Yeah, yeah, which, so I think it's about which that. Is, uh, which is nice, but we haven't heard much from them, unfortunately, yet. But of course, that's important for us to, to get feedback. And we also, I mean, uh, there are technical problems. For example, at Amazon Kindle, you they don't give you the, the email addresses of people that bought the book. So we can't simply send them email. But... Um, we try to reach out to them and encourage them to provide feedback. I would recommend, I, oh, sorry, Polina, what were you going to say? I, I was just going to agree with Lars that, yeah, we're definitely looking for feedback and any comments and anything that's not clear or, um, yeah, we would definitely like to hear from the readers. Awesome. Awesome. I would like to encourage everyone, whether you're a software developer or not, and if you are, or whether you're developing in Haskell or whether you want to, develop in Plutus, or you're just a long-term hodler in the project, go and purchase the book on Amazon. If you have a Kindle, get that ranking up because that's going to push our SEO up and ultimately we'll reach the target audience for the particular book. So, you know, show your support for sure. Um, so 
I guess you can take us back to your course in Ethiopia. What are some of the prerequisites that someone would need as a developer in order to start with this book and start coding successfully? I mean, it's, of course, Plutus is more or less Haskell. So, um, I mean, if you know Haskell, then you're good. Of course, you still have to understand the, the blockchain part of it. But um, if you're in interested in, in blockchain, if you read the, Polina's chapter about the extended UTXO model, then that should hopefully get you started quickly. But you um, you do need Haskell, and and there are some parts uh, reason te for technical reasons how it works that are relatively advanced Haskell, so-called template Haskell, which in Ethiopia we only did in the last week of the course or so. But it's not as bad as it sounds because that is very schematic. So whenever you write on-chain code, you must somehow tell Haskell that this will be on-chain code, and and you need this template Haskell. But it's it's in a very schematic way. So I think you don't really have to understand all the intricacies of template Haskell to to use it for Plutus. And therefore, that was also one of the reasons why we did a lot of examples in the book. So if you if you look at the examples, this template Haskell part is always used in exactly the same way. So hopefully. Um, just by looking at the examples, even people that are not that familiar with advanced Haskell uh, should hopefully not have a problem. And the, the rest, the logic itself, it's actually very um, intermediate or, or beginner Haskell. It's, it's no, you don't need really fancy monads or monad transformers or all these scary things or lenses. It's, it's basically down to earth, uh, relatively simple Haskell. And I hope looking at the examples, even if you hadn't been familiar with Haskell before, should make it possible to 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 get into it and, and it try did. useful programs. It, yeah, the, the first section of the book is on UTXO. And I had a hard time understanding UTXO. It's just so difficult to wrap my head around it. And the first section has examples. There's illustrations and narrative paragraphs describing how UTXO works before it gets into the heavy code. And I could just skip over the sections of code because uh, I didn't understand it, but I did get a much better understanding of UTXO and how it works in the blockchain because it is difficult to grasp. I cannot imagine how difficult it was to write that chapter and make it easy enough for other people to understand. That took a lot of work. Well done, was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm working on it. Hopefully it'll be a little bit easier for the next, uh, next release. <laughs> How much, how much of the book evolved from the curriculum from Ethiopia? So um, in Ethiopia, we for the Plutus part of the class, we mostly went over the tutorials, um, uh, which were the original explanations of how to use Plutus. And um, a lot of the book, um, so the tutorials start directly from the Plutus um, part. Uh, and and they give, like they explain what, um, what the Plutus core language is and, um, and then go on to give examples. And um, uh, we, so Lars, when he wrote his example chapters are different than the ones in the tutorial, um, but uh, they ha have common exam they have common examples. So I, so definitely it's an evolution from, you know, the, how we are trying to explain Plutus to anybody who wants to use and develop it in it. Right, we also felt um, that I mean, on the one hand, we, we wanted to have the examples from the tutorials also in the book, but on the other hand, I, I thought it would be silly to, to just copy the tutorials, because I, I have always felt um, back at university, you have these seminars where, where, you, where you get a scientific paper and then once a week, uh, one student um, gives a talk about one paragraph or one chapter and then everybody together tries to understand it. And I al was always really upset when I prepared at home and read the paragraph and didn't understand something and then was looking forward to the explanation next week when the person talked about that paragraph and then that person would basically just read literally from the paper. And then I thought, yeah, well, I mean, if I didn't, didn't understand it when I read it there, why would I understand it now if somebody reads it to me? So yeah. I always think that's silly and a waste of time. So you should try to um, use your own words and I mean, try to, people things that you don't understand when you read it, try to, if you want to explain it, then obviously you, you shouldn't just use the same words that you already didn't understand, but try to explain it in a different way and give people chances. I mean, people also learn in different ways. Some are more uh, example oriented, some more this, some more that. So, so I think it's important to give as many channels of understanding as possible. So I, I try to make a point of ex not looking at how the tutorial explains, uh, explains stuff. And even though I took similar examples or the same examples, basically explain it in a completely independent way to give people the chance to, uh, another mm -hmm. chance to understand it. 
and yeah. yeah. And it looks like the examples in the book follow in a manner that they can, uh, a learner could go on the Plutus playground, follow the examples in the book and execute the code. Is that the basic idea? Yes, that's the basic idea. So I made sure there are also screenshots in, in the book and they are not faked. So I really took the code from the book, pasted it into the playground and, and it worked. Okay. Of course, there is this problem that Plutus is still evolving. So the Plutus team is changing the playground every now and again. So, but we do try to keep the book up, uh, up to date and then we'll also release updates uh, every once in a while. So, so we are aware of that problem that's unavoidable because of course we want the language to evolve as well. But yes, uh, everything was, was tested in the playground and the idea is that you only need the playground. So in principle, you can do everything in the playground and it should work. So you can just type the, or copy paste the text from the book into the playground and then it should work in your browser. So you don't have to install any software. You can just use your browser and the playground. Okay, okay. I have a question. Uh, I'm going to move to a separate chapter of the book, and we're going to be talking about smart contracts now. So everyone's excited about smart contracts. Everyone's excited about Gogan and Plutus finally deploying on the main net and actual smart contract use cases being implemented. So in the book, you focus on uh, non-fungible tokens, and you, you went through this example of uh, like uh, you used like the Mona Lisa token and the Starry Night token, and um, you know, are, are these are these hints to what use cases could be used for uh, for Plutus? Is it something like we're going to be seeing art or certain certain non fungible tokens being created in the future that's going to um, I don't know move blockchain forward as far as smart contracts? If my question makes any sense. Well, I mean, we don't give financial advice in this Ooh. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I just wanted it to be a fun chapter. So I just wanted some some story to, so I don't know how realistic that is, but it's certainly realistic. I mean, people do put, um, for example, real estate on the blockchain, or I think, I mean, there are lots of ideas or once at a conference, somebody showed me pictures of vintage cars that were on the blockchain somehow. And uh, I mean, I'm not no expert in financial applications or um, I mean, in, in real applications of blockchain, but I mean, that's one of the things people are interested in doing, linking real world objects or houses or cars or whatever uh, to, to entities on the blockchain. And my understanding is that's done with non-fungible tokens. So I thought it would be a nice idea to use uh, works of art um, as an example, but it doesn't mean that uh, IHK is now planning to, to do that specific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's just an idea. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to have a theme for uh, right for something like that for a cohesive example. Or yes. any developer out there using those examples will help give developers ideas and say which direction can I take this. Like I always use the example of coupons. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to see coupons put on a blockchain. And people laugh at me and like, oh, that's stupid. One <laughs> of these days, some guy's going to make coupons on a blockchain. They're going to make millions of dollars, not financial <laughs> things. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I, I followed the story very well. So, and I'm not a developer. So even if you're not a developer, you can follow that example and it, it leads through from chapter to chapter. So I thought that was that's a good nice. example. Yeah, that's very nice of you to say. I'm glad to hear that. So, yeah, of course you, I mean, the hope is that people will get inspired and, and of course it's, um, I mean, in the book, it probably sounds quite painful and difficult to write these things and it's quite complicated. But the hope, of course, is also that we have, will have something like a standard library eventually. I think the Plutus team is already working on that or at least thinking about it. So that these standard things like non-fungibility and non-fungible tokens, fungible tokens, auctions probably, stuff like that, that will hopefully all be available in the library so people don't, each time they, they need parts of that, won't always have to develop it from scratch, but can then take it from some standard library to make it easier for people to do these common things that you often okay. need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I wanted to backtrack. Uh, a couple episodes ago, we had Professor Simon Thompson on, and we were speaking about Marlowe. And we were in, uh, he was telling us about what domain-specific languages are and being built within Plutus. So uh, using your book, um, if someone wanted to create... Uh, another Marlowe, but for a different use case, could they take your book and is that the stepping stone to create a domain specific language or are there intermediary steps between that someone would need to learn? 
Um, well, the, in the upcoming version of the book, there will be a chapter on implementing a Marlowe interpreter in Plutus. So, um, so Plutus is is quite powerful, and um, you're able to if you make up your own domain specific language, you, you're able to implement it in Plutus. And we're going to try and explain how how to do that um, using Marlowe as an example. When people write code in Marlowe, is it a large executable program? Not Marlowe, I'm sorry, Plutus. Is it a large executable program? The examples I saw looked kind of small, and I've seen examples in C++, and it'll take up the two or three pages in an example, but I noticed it was rather compact. Is that by design? Well, <clears throat> I mean, several things there. I mean, obviously, it's it's a book for beginners, an introductory book, so the examples are obviously simple examples. Um, but then also Haskell, of course, it tends to be much shorter than, uh, I mean, code written, not uh, completely independent of blockchain. Uh, if you take any domain and write a program in Haskell or in C++, then the Haskell program tends to be much shorter. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Haskell is so nice. So it tends to be very compact. And because it's so powerful and abstract, um, you, you can avoid a lot of code duplication on boilerplate that you would have to write in other languages. So that's certainly a thing. I mean. Plutus is Haskell, so all the advantages that Haskell has in regard to writing concise code, Plutus inherits from Haskell. So, so I think it's both. It's because it's a book for beginners, so the examples are not that complex, but it's also because Haskell really is concise and short. Yes, okay. and so a quick summary for people who are new to the podcast, Haskell is the Turing complete version of the language, is that correct? And then the Plutus is the domain specific version of the uh, language. Haskell is too incomplete, but Plutus is also too incomplete. Um, Marlowe is not. Marlowe is not. And Marlowe is the domain specific language which is written in Plutus. But Plutus is also too incomplete. Basically, one, one way where you can easily see whether something is too incomplete or not, I think, although Polina is the expert on Turing stuff, <laughs> would be that uh, Marlowe contracts always terminate. So you can't write a Marlowe contract that runs forever. But you can easily write a Plutus contract that runs forever. Ever. So there yeah, you, you could yeah. you could write a game with Plutus, some yes. sort of blockchain yeah. game. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Because cool. So I wanted to backtrack to our last episode in Africa. So towards the end of the episode, I remember both of you telling me that you know you're open to teaching the plutus class in various different countries if iohk were to create some sort of program in different countries so have you heard anything where are you planning on going on a world tour for your for your plutus class anytime soon or um what are what are your future plans as far as 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 teaching well there's the udemy course and i think and um so i i i don't think that there's going to be a separate Plutus course taught on on like on location. That's not part of the bigger Haskell course, but the Udemy courses for sure um, are going to be updated. And you know, I think we're I think the plan is to try and keep them in sync with the act actual Plutus development. Okay, right. And the Haskell course from now on will uh, probably always contain a, a Plutus part in the end, like we did in Ethiopia. And uh, if you're asking where the next Haskell course, which will then have this Plutus part is going to be, and we're not sure, but maybe Mongolia, I think is very high on the list. Um, okay. Yes, so that's probably the most likely candidate, Mongolia, but it's not decided yet. Okay, so I have a question for both of you. Uh, writing a book is a very arduous process and it can be very time consuming. Um, what was, was this, was this book writing process, was it fun? What, what did you look forward to most when writing this book? I really enjoyed writing the book and yeah, I really enjoyed learning about Plutus and, you know, of course, understanding something is, but when you're teaching something, you understand it much better um, as Lars was saying earlier. So I really, I really enjoyed it and it's fun to try and convey complicated concepts in as simple terms as possible. So it, I thought it was really cool to have the opportunity to do that with something like so new and interesting as Plutus? When I was a child, I always wanted to become a writer when I grew up. Of course, I didn't back then think of writing um, technical books. I was more thinking of science fiction or something like that, but, but nevertheless, so I was very happy to get the opportunity to write this book now. 
and uh, it was a lot of fun for me and I was really looking forward to it. So so when it was clear that we would have to do that or would be allowed to do that, um, I was very excited and, and couldn't wait for, for the writing to start. And um, so I loved the writing and I also, as Polina said, it was a lot of fun to actually learn Plutus. So I was, because I it always, if, if I don't understand something, I'm it always gives me like heartburn. And um, so that was always a painful spot that I had this feeling there's this Plutus thing sounds very cool, but I don't really understand it. So I was looking forward to being forced by writing the book to to actually do understand it and be able to spend time with it and um, um, spend time figuring out how exactly it works, play with it, uh, do the examples. And, and so so that was really a lot of fun. So I really enjoyed it. Well, you should be uh, happy with your accomplishment because I think in the years to come, there will be thousands of people looking to this book for guidance and there will be updates coming out. I wanted to ask you about some of the other people involved with the writing of the book. You gave credits at the beginning. There were other people, Niam Ahern, Michael Peyton Jones, Alejandro Garcia, and the IOHK Plutus team. They were instrumental in the writing of the book. So we wanted to give an honorable shout out to those folks. So do you guys enjoy working with them as you develop this book? Nah, they're all stuck. Of course we do. <laughs> <laughs> Did they provide peer review? <laughs> well, um, Niev and uh, Alejandro are actually in my department, in the education department. And um, Niev is a technical writer. And Alejandro, incidentally, started as a project manager at IOHK, and then he wanted to... Uh, was more interested in education so he shifted to education so uh, they both bring their expertise to, to that so Niev um, always read the basically edited the chapters that Polina and I wrote um, she's not a software developer so it's a bit like yourself Rick so she could appreciate the prose but not really the code but um, at least she I mean she went through the through the text and, and made suggestions and fixed typos and so on. So that was very helpful. And Alejandro took care of, of lots of things like um, he actually um, dealt with Amazon and LeanPub and found out what exactly technically we have to do to publish publish a book there. And he also um, helped with lots of the diagrams. So you said you like the diagrams in the book. So a lot of them are from Alejandro, were provided by Alejandro. These diagrams, how transactions work in the UTXO model and so on. So that was very good. And then, um, of course, the Plutus team, I mean, without them, there wouldn't be Plutus. And uh, we mentioned Michael Peton Jones in particular, because he was like our contact person, or, uh, our point of contact. So whenever I got stuck and said, how do you do that in Plutus? Or how would you do that? Or, or if I thought I found a bug in the playground or somewhere, then Michael was always very helpful. And he also helped with the technical setup. We, I mean, technically, we wrote this book in something called ASCII Doctor. It's like Markdown, if maybe people have heard of that. It's more or less plain text format, but you have the uh, possibility to like insert images and do certain formatting things and links and so on. And uh, that was his idea to actually use ASCII Doctor instead of Markdown or LaTeX or something else. And, and he also took care of making that a very smooth experience to integrate that into the Plutus repo. So for example, also all the code examples in the book, they are actually not just text, they are real Haskell programs or Plutus programs, and they are built in continuous integration each time somebody pushes on, on Plutus. So each time they change Plutus on this GitHub repo, the book is compiled and all the tests in the book are run. There are tests for all the examples. So if they change something in Plutus and then something is some of the code examples in the book doesn't work anymore, the build would fail and people would immediately realize that. So that's actually very nice. So, so it's basically technically guaranteed that all the code examples stay relevant for the book. The same can't be said for the prose, obviously, because right now artificial intelligence is not ooh, as ooh. advanced. <laughs> so, so we have to update the text by hand, but at least the code, we can be sure it always will work. I mean, it's always in sync with what Plutus is doing. And Michael uh, was very helpful there and he set all of that up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I definitely would both really appreciate, um, you know, the collaborative effort of writing this book and, uh, um, you know, getting it edited and Michael doing a lot of the work that Lars was just describing. Uh, yeah, so yeah, definitely like uh, it would have been really hard if it was just us two working on it, trying to navigate our way through Plutus <laughs> with blindfolds. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, one of the key words in the title is reliable smart contact contract. So we would want to make sure the smart contract examples in the book are certainly reliable. Yeah. And I don't know, if, are there examples of unreliable smart contracts? I don't know if Solidity, you know, I know, I understand there can be bugs and stuff like that. Is there some way to, to bug proof the software or... I mean, we also believe or one of the reasons why we use Haskell at, at IHK is um, because, I mean, for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is that we believe it's much more secure than other languages. And one of the reasons for that is that it's functional. And so one of the, I mean, there are many different ways you can explain what that means and characterize it. But but one way is um, state. I mean, it's always dangerous if, if lots of people at the same time can manipulate state and it's very difficult to understand that. For example, a concrete example is in Ethereum, uh, all the accounts are state. So so it's state. It's a stateful model. So at every second, certain accounts have so much money and then the contracts in in Ethereum, they they change these states. They, they take money from one account to the other account and so on. So at any every time the state changes and it's very difficult to, to analyze it, what will happen because you, um, you can't really um, if you want to analyze it, you you must always know what was the state at that time when that contract ran and so on. So it makes it very difficult. And with this extended UTXO model, it's uh, much, much easier and much better and um, m much easier to analyze. And in the same way as Haskell is easier to, to reason about, Plutus is also easier to reason about. And so we hope that a certain class of bugs that are possible in, for example, um, Solidity, aren't even possible in, in Plutus in the same way as the class of bugs that are possible in C++ or Java or Python are not even possible in Haskell. So we hope that the security advantages of, of Haskell, that Haskell has in, to other language, that that also translate into, translates into security advantages from Plutus in comparison to more traditional smart contract languages like Solidity. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you explained that, but I have a question. Teach, I have a question. What's, what is the, uh, the basic difference between the extended UTXO and the extended? What's that little uh, UTXO? The, ex the E in extended or? Uh -huh. The extended and the classic? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, um, I mean, the difference that rel that's relevant for Plutus is that um, in the extended model, there's uh, extra pieces of data that are stored on the blockchain or in a transaction that, is, that are called scripts, which is the actual um, Plutus core code that we, um, is, that we, we write in you know, Plutus Playground or otherwise. And um, so these, um, these scripts are run to check whether transactions are allowed to spend certain outputs. And what that depends on is, is, is what the contract in the script says. So that's the general idea of how Plutus is going to be used in the UTXO model to, to implement these contracts. Okay, so the UTXO, it's just the transactions itself, but with the extended, it includes the scripts. It includes the scripts, yeah. So in the UTXO, if you can send a transaction and, you know, if it's, um, and it can spend an output, but, um, but in the extended UTXO, some of these transactions, if they're paying to or from scripts, they have to have these additional, additional to or from contracts, they have to have these additional scripts that are used to check whether they're allowed to do so. Right, so in the traditional UTXO model, if you want to grab some money from one of the UTXOs, the unspent transaction outputs, if you want to take it, you prove that you have the right to take it by proving that you have the right secret key to the public yeah. key. And in the extended UTXO model, that still works, public key, secret key, but in addition, you can also prove that you can take certain outputs by with a script. So a script is run and the script spits out uh, true or false, and if it spits out true, you can take the money. Yeah. So it, it adds the scripting, checking whether you are allowed to consume some input, um, which in the standard model is only with public key, secret key, in the extended yeah. model, it runs a script and the script decides. So that's yeah. the E extended. Yeah, so the, the script is where the contract, is, so the script is the contract and the different parts of the script that are applied to each other are the different parts of the contract that you have to write in Plutus. And actually Excellent. that idea is um, very old. That is already part of Bitcoin, but in Bitcoin, this E is a, is a very small E. There are only very limited scripting capability. But in, in principle, even Bitcoin already had that um, 
capabilities. So even in Bitcoin, you have this idea of scripts that run and check whether you can consume input or not. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank okay. you for that description. That was perfect. Rick, we're, we're, get, we're getting towards the latter half of the podcast. So I don't know if you want to flip the re through the Reddit questions. Yes, there were a lot of good Reddit questions on there. Yes. So let's head over yes. to those. I sorted by best, Rick. Ooh. Roger. Okay, so this one is from Lion Likes Cookies. And this person says, thanks Lars and Polina for the Plutus book. It is, it is a nice guide to how Plutus fits in with Cardano. My question, would you be interested in providing more Haskell content? I'm relatively new to Haskell and think it would be nice to see off-chain code with tools, best practices, patterns, and maybe build a simple user interface for a Cardano app. Thank you. Well, that's a great question, of course. And um, I think, I mean, first of all, I'm not sure whether it would really make sense to, to like uh, write an introduction to Haskell into, into the Plutus book. I mean, there are other books out there to learn Haskell. But of course, if, if the question, the second part of the question was more about how to write a user interface, so how to really do it in, um, to really integrate a contract. And I think that is a great suggestion and we will definitely do that, but until we can only do that once this has completely um, settled how they actually want to do that, how the integration will actually work. I mean, they, they have of course ideas, but right now, um, Plutus is not yet on Cardano, so we don't know exactly yet how how exactly this integration and deployment of scripts and so and interaction with scripts will work. As soon as we do, then that's definitely a great idea to to give more examples, uh, really um, from start to finish, how, an app including UI and everything to to have a full full example that actually includes also this UI expect as well. But right now, where we only have the playground, I think it's a bit premature to write something like that. And, you know, there was a question earlier on in the program I forgot to ask, and that was, who's the target audience for this book? It's covered in the preface of the book, uh, just to follow up on the question from Lions Likes Cookies. And the target audience for the book is, uh, this book aims to educate beginner Haskell developers in the fundamentals of Plutus. It's the first book written about Plutus and uses real-life samples to help anchor the application. So there's a basic idea that you have some uh, prior knowledge of Haskell, that you've done some basic work on Haskell prior to getting to Plutus. That's pretty much uh, the way it works, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. okay. So it's a good idea to have an idea of Haskell first, but that, yes. that's still a great question there from Lines Like Cookies. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, next question. Okay. Next question here is from Nissan Tent Event. <laughs> <laughs> I love these Reddit names. Yeah. All right. Excellent question here. It's if it's off topic, we can't answer it, uh, or Philippe and I can answer it. Yeah. And the question is, how will the partnership with Confidio impact the future development and or future applications of Plutus? Do you have an answer for that, or you want to defer? I defer to either Polina or Rick and Philippe. Con okay. Conf Confidio. Confidio. Yeah, it's a recent partnership, I believe, with the foundation. So I'm not sure. I, I don't really know too much about it, so I'm not sure how this is. Uh, I don't know how to answer this question, Rick. Even though what we say is right until we're proven otherwise. Oh God, we're stuck <laughs> answering this. Do we yeah. want to flip a coin? You answer it, or I got to answer it. Heads Are you or tails? Man. Heads or tails? Do you have a coin? I don't have a coin. <laughs> <laughs> you answer it. You take this one, Rick. Oh God. Okay. Yeah. You, you get the next one then. Okay. So uh, it'll help you to put gas in your Lambo. That's my answer. Okay. All right. <laughs> Next, question. Next question. I'm sorry for that. I don't mean to make fun of the questions. Thank you for that question. That one tent event. Okay. We're going to have to defer that. For the meantime, the answer is more gas in Lambo by having the Confidio. Okay. So that sounds good. We'll go with that for now. Um, so the next user, of course, I get this name, Fat Frequently. So I love the Reddit names. Will the book be updated to include lessons on writing JavaScript, other languages that convert to Plutus? First of all, the book will be updated right now. Polina mentioned earlier, she's writing on a chapter on Marlow. And um, I did. I, I was busy now with a chapter on um, state machines and an example of an online auction system. Uh, and if there was another language like JavaScript compiling to Plutus, 
then we certainly would write a chapter about it. But right now there is nothing like that. But I do know there are plans. I mean, there are plans to 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 somehow decrease, uh, lower the hurdle of, of entrance into Pluto's, as you asked before, Rick. So right now it's mostly aimed at uh, beginning beginner Haskell developers. And of course, we are aware of the fact that very few people actually know Haskell. So, so there are plans to, to, for example, make it possible to write JavaScript and then have it compiled into Plutus. But that's not been done yet. So, so obviously, there are no concrete plans yet to, to write chapters. But as soon as there are avenues like that, if there are um, bindings for other languages and, and ways to, to write Plutus contracts in other languages, then I'm sure we will write uh, corresponding chapters, of course. It's a very good idea to do that once it's possible. But right now, it's it's too early to say how exactly that will work. So we are not doing it now, but we will certainly do it later. Yeah, any way to lower the barrier for entry for um, using and writing Plutus contracts is would be would definitely be a step in the right direction. So mm -hmm. if that happens, that'd be nice. Okay. Yeah. Would you would you consider someone that wrote in a different language that compiled to Plutus? Um, would you consider them a Plutus developer? Like, could they go around and, because Charles says 10,000 Plutus developers. So could someone that was writing in a different language that's constantly compiling the Plutus be considered one of those 10,000? Or would you say that you would have to be adept at Haskell to be one of those, one of those people? I mean, if, if they write, if they write, if they make the software that compiles to Plutus, then they're definitely, I would say that definitely they're, <laughs> they are, but if, um, but right now there's Plutus and, you know, for now, I think probably it's like developing in Plutus. No, I'm kidding. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. definitely you know encourage what? people to, to learn Plutus and, you know, because it's interesting and, you know, has a lot of capabilities. So. You know, if we're going to reach those 10,000 developers, then we're going to need to train more professors. So you guys should go to universities and train the professors how to be professors on Haskell and Plutus. <laughs> so you could be like Professor McGonagall and Professor Dumbledore being the professor <laughs> professor. <laughs> <laughs> that, could, that would help. We need more teachers. Yeah. <laughs> you could be te te teach teachers. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to come back to, to Philip's uh, question quickly. So I think actually, of course, um, I would consider those uh, part of the 10,000. And I think, uh, I mean, Haskell is not the essential part here. The essential part is that you understand this extended UTXO model. And I think that is more important than the Haskell part. I mean, I love Haskell, obviously, so I would never do it in a different language. I, I'm, I mean, it's one of the best features for me that you can do it in Haskell. But if somebody wants to do it in another language, why not? As long as they understand how it works and that has nothing to do with Haskell per se. That's just this understanding this extended UTXO model. Then I see no reason why you wouldn't be allowed to call yourself a Plutus developer um, anyway. Mm -hmm. If you write it in JavaScript and it compiles to Plutus. I mean, you still have to understand the, the model and so that's fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's definitely one of the main challenges is um, like not not under not like being familiar with you know the syntax of the code, but understanding the concepts behind what you're doing and how these contracts are actually used. Um, I think once you understand that, you'll be fine with. Well, you're definitely in the Plutus team. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. That's good, Rick. Let's move on to the next question. All right, next question, also from Fat Frequently. Thanks for the frequent questions, Fat Frequently. Okay. And we definitely appreciate them. Can you, <laughs> and the question is, can you give us a specific example of where lines in a formal specification pen, can be clearly translated to Haskell, but not to another program language? And so I think what they're asking, is there something you can do in Haskell that you cannot do in another language? Well. I mean, Polina is the formal methods expert, so she should probably answer that. But I mean, in principle, of right. course, um, you can do everything in every language. I mean, all languages out there, um, Python, Java, C++, Haskell, are all doing complete and general purpose languages. And what you can do in one, you can always do in all the others. So in that sense, the question doesn't make really sense. But of course, I mean, the point is that it's easier 
to do it in Haskell and certain uh, than to other languages, and that the chance of you making a mistake is lower. And the reason for that is that Haskell is just closer to the to the language of mathematics and these formal specifications, at least yeah. the way Polina and her team writes them. I mean, it's very mathematical. <laughs> And uh, so it's very it's a very small step to take to take this specification and translate it into Haskell. Yeah, you it's, can it's, also it's very close. JavaScript, but um, it's just a much bigger conceptual gap, and you have much more opportunity of making a mistake. Yeah, I mean, formal specifications are are an explanation, like a really specific explanation of how something's supposed to work. Um, so, you know, ho hopefully, you can do that in most pro in, in any programming language, or yeah. Implement what it's okay. saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that's good because the question is can the formal specification be translated into Haskell? And uh, I think you guys Definitely. bring up a good point. If you can make a formal spec into any language, yes, you uh, can translate language, it into every language. It's just easier to do it in Haskell and, and easier to not make mistakes while you do that. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. okay. So, okay. Philippe, I like that answer. Can we go Sounds on to good. the next one? All right, this is from our frequent flyer, Tony from Shoshone. Thank you for putting out some great questions. So Tony from Shoshone says, I'm enjoying your book, Plutus Writing Reliable Smart Contracts. In fact, I'm enjoying the book so much that I wanna incorporate much of the book's contents into an eighth grade technology class that I teach. The book's colophon, I've never heard of that word before. How do you pronounce that, Rick? I don't know, colophon. Okay. Colophon. I'd say colophon. Okay. Colophon. Okay. States all content and material have been produced by Input Output Hong Kong Limited and can be reused in accordance with the Apache 2.0 license. After reading through the Apache 2.0 license, it appears as if I can utilize code and excerpts from the book for producing additional educational materials as long as I preserve the copyright notice and disclaimer. Is this correct? I mean, neither Polina or I are lawyers, obviously, but that was definitely our intention that that it's exactly like like he says yeah. that you can take it and use it and i mean that's our philosophy at ihk anyway that I mean, charles is always going on that he would be happy if somebody clones our cardano code and mm -hmm. builds something better and um, mm -hmm. and definitely we wanted to the same to be true for the book so that was our intention when we wrote this colophon um, so yes, please go ahead and and teach your class. And yes, for free we would. Yeah, yes. yeah that, that's why. I mean, that's why you can get it for free. Um, you know, we really hope that as many people see it and you know make use of it and um, as possible. And did you say eighth grade class? Is that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's. Yeah. I want to. I want to hear about how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. actually, that would be very nice. If he, if he uses it for his class, we would be very interested um, to hear about it, how for it goes. Sure, yeah. We could, yeah. I mean, he could, for example, even maybe write a blog post about it that we publish mm -hmm. on our website or something. Yeah. So we'd definitely be curious how it works. Yeah. Yes. And, yes. and for future reference, if we have any more questions along that lines about can people recycle code, then copy and paste. Is there a person that we should direct them to at IOHK? Um, I know you mentioned Michael Peyton Jones earlier, Alejandro Garcia, Niam Ahern. Should we should guide them to somebody and say, please direct those questions to? I somebody? think that, I mean, those are Niam, um, Alejandro, and Michael are also no legal experts. But um, I mean, our intention that clearly was that people can use it, and it would be nice if they if they mention it when mention us when they do, but can can use it. If there's really a tricky legal question, then I mean, of course, IHK has legal uh, counsel, but I think for things like that, it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes cool. sense. That makes also under the general Apache 2.0 license, which is similar to Community Commons or Creative right. Commons. Creative Commons. Mm -hmm. We we okay. use Creative Commons for this channel. Yeah. Okay, so you probably know more about these things than we do. Mm -hmm. No, I just read it and said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tony from Shoshone. And we have one more Reddit question. Rick, do you want to take it away? Yes, sir. Last question is from Hummingbird. Hummingbird asks, I am tickled to see the additional chapter on non-fungible tokens. That's a chapter Philippe was referring to earlier, mm -hmm. or it goes throughout the book. But would not have known it was there if I did not dig deep into the weekly updates. 
can you share any additional planned chapters? Well, the plan is to have regular updates to the book, at least now, I mean, in, in principle forever, but of course it's more important now because the language is still changing more. So um, at least once a month, we, we will take all the updates we have and, and update mm -hmm. the Amazon version and update the LeanPub version. Uh, in the meantime, I think the Pluto's repository is, is open, all right? It's public. So everybody okay. in principle, of course, can go to the, or am mm -hmm. I mistaken? I'm not completely sure whether it is public. Uh, the I have to check. <laughs> yeah, the GitHub of yes, I, I believe it's uh, it's public. It's public. Right. So in principle, everything is there, and everybody can, of course, always see the bleeding edge. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, yes, we will also provide regular updates at least once a month. So this uh, non fungible token chapter will be in the next update, and hopefully also the chapter on Marlow and yeah. the state machine auction system chapter. So okay. we will have regular updates. Yeah. And if somebody is too impatient to wait, then they can go to the Plutus repository and and just look in the Plutus book uh, folder yeah. and get the latest at yeah. all times. OK. OK, that sounds good. Now, even instructions how to build the book. So you don't have to read this Ask a Doctor like the yeah. hardcore source code. You can, uh, there's instructions how to, to compile it, and then you get a PDF or HTML version of it. Thanks, Lars, and thanks, Hummingbird, for these excellent questions. Thank you to all of our Reddit users who come on here. You guys provide great questions. I appreciate it, ladies and gentlemen, who provide our questions for our guests. And uh, Philippe, that's that's all I really have. I've yes. learned so much today, and yes. I'm very grateful for the both of you coming on to the podcast that, that, you, that you've taken the time to come here and talk with our viewers, provide more information and more insightful information. I think people are excited to see this book. I think people are glad to hear that it will be updated as time goes on. Uh, personally, I am fascinated to see you create the technology and the training required to understand the technology unfolding right before my very eyes. I did not get to see Google get developed. I did not get to see all these smartphones get developed. So I consider myself fortunate to see all of you, all the team at IOHK and Emergo and the Cardano Foundation creating these products, books, software. I'm very happy to be involved. So thank you all for coming on the podcast today. I would like to turn it over to Philippe if you have anything else to add, or if you want to take us yes. out. Yes, yes. So I'd like to remind everyone that it is on, available on Amazon and you should go and check it out, purchase it. If you have Kindle Unlimited, I believe it's free as well. So that's a Amazon based plan and, and, and just buy it and get that SEO up, get that rank up. And you know, that's what helps the book grow. And that's what helps Plutus reach more eyes. Amazon is a gigantic platform. So if we can push it up as much as possible, that would be great. That would be great. So before we sign off, are there any final words that you have Lars and Polina for the viewers of the Cardano effect? Anyone, anything you wanted to talk about? Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for uh, bringing us on to discuss the book. And I think it's a really great way to, you know, um, get the word out to as many people as possible. So we definitely encourage everybody to you know, get the book and, um, you know, re re read it and teach it to your eighth grade class and see what happens. Um, <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for having us on. And it was fun. Lars. Yes. yes. Thank you very much for, for having us at the, it was a lot of fun and uh, we are very excited about the book and it, it's uh, very grateful that you gave us the opportunity to talk about it. And it's uh, really cool to see how interested people are. And I'm also Definitely. thrilled by this um, teacher that wants to do a, a Plutus course in his eighth grade course. So, so things like that are wonderful. Uh, it's, it's, it's very cool. Definitely. So thank you very much. Oh yeah. And it's also available on LeanPub as well as Amazon. Okay. Yes. We'll yeah. drop the links in the description below so everyone will be able mm -hmm. to see it. And thank you again for showing up on the Cardano Effect podcast. You're welcome here anytime. We'd love to have you on. Maybe when you create the updates of the book, we can talk about it. And uh, until the next episode of the Cardano Effect, bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>